Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started. It's 11, and uh, we're going to stick to our schedule as tightly as we can. Um, we have another session now of lightning talks. There's a lot of interest on ethics and mapping and AI, so we have quite a few uh, really interesting presenters um, that are going to go through various aspects and facets of those topics now. Um, we will have another Q&A session like we had before, and then we'll go over to um, Botanical Garden on campus for lunch. Uh, there, just to give you a preview, there will be a set menu to pick from. And then for those of you who have dietary uh, restrictions or needs, uh, there's also another full menu that you can kind of choose some stuff from. So, all right, a little bit of preview. Our uh, first speaker is not able to join us in person, uh, Yuha Kang and colleagues uh, at the University of South Carolina and University of Wisconsin-Madison um, have provided a little video. So they've got a five minute video of their talk and we'll kick it off now. Hello everyone. It is my great pleasure to attend the Map AI workshop and to meet with scholars who have interest in artificial intelligence. I'm Yu Hao Kang, an assistant professor leading the GI science lab and working on artificial intelligence for cartography for several years at the University of South Carolina. Today, I would like to share with you our recent work about AI-generated maps. This work was collaborated with Qian Hen Zhang from the University of Washington, Seattle, and Rob Ross from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Artificial generative models such as Dollar 2, Stable Diffusion, and Mid Journey provide opportunities to facilitate map making process. Can generative AI produce maps? Here, we made an exploration using the following prompts with Dollar 2. As you can see, we generated some example maps in different regions with a variety of styles. These maps deliver basic geographic information, have the shapes of different regions, may have certain spatial patterns, and the maps can be placed at different locations. This coincides with the review that we presented at the Autocarto conference last year. Geospatial Artificial Intelligence, or GeoAI, has successfully been integrated for cartography research. As illustrated in this figure, GeoAI could benefit and support a variety of geographic uh, and cartographic design decisions. However, as we pointed out in the review, the ethical implementations, the ethical implications of GeoAI for cartography remains un underdeveloped. Cartographers have always been concerned, concerned about the ethical issues that arise from maps, such as the inaccuracies due to data uncertainty and the bias influenced by um, power. Similarly, Dollar 2 generated maps may also raise ethical concerns. Here, I summarize four ethical concerns. The first issue refers to inaccuracy. AI-generated maps may have unclear and distorted borderlines between different regions. The shapes of places also may be inconsistent. And Dollar 2 may generate truncated contacts due to the fixed square aspect ratio. AI-generated maps also can produce misleading information, such as pseudo words, symbols, or characters. More severely, generative AI may create regions that do not exist in reality. AI-generated maps may also create unexpected or unanticipated features. For example, Dollar 2 may misunderstood heat map and create a map styled in glowing tones similar to lava flows. Finally, AI-generated maps cannot be reproduced with the same keyword set. Therefore, it is crucial to examine the potential ethical concerns raised by these AI-generated maps. 
to address these issues, we developed an AI-generated map detector system that can identify whether a map is generated by AI or is a human design map. Such an AI-generated map detector can be useful in various applications, such as identifying potential cases of AI-generated maps being used to spread misinformation on online social media platforms. To summarize, although generative AI may have the potential to facilitate the map-making process, it is essential to consider potential ethical concerns that arise from AI-generated maps. In the future, it is critical for cartographers to work alongside AI developers and have the cartographer in the loop in the development of AI to ensure that the future AI could produce high-quality maps while minimizing potential ethical concerns and negative social implications. The paper has been published on archive. Please feel free to take a read. That's all. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I welcome all kinds of feedbacks. Thanks, Anthony. I'm Tim Presby. I'm a PhD student at Penn State, and I'll just jump right in. Today, I'm here to talk about intersection of AI, trust, and cartography. And so my dissertation focuses on trust, and trust is a really nebulous concept, and it's hard to pin down. So I really want to start by defining trust. And so here you can see three different definitions of trust used by fellow scholars in InfoViz and cartography. Based on these definitions and other work that I've looked into, I have a working definition of trust as the willingness to rely on geospatial information interpreted from a map with the expectation that the information has been ethically and accurately represented by the cartographer. And so it's been really, I'm really glad that I went after so many presentations because it's pretty clear that ethics and accuracy are of paramount importance when we're talking about AI in the context of cartography. And so really what I want to talk about today is are AI generated maps trustworthy? Are they ethical? Are they accurate? And should we rely on them? And so these are two different maps generated by Dali, as you all had been talking about. I would argue that one looks a lot more trustworthy than the other. The one that's in greens and yellows seems to not really make a lot of sense. And there's all these weird labels. But the one that's in blues and oranges, the symbology actually looks pretty intuitive. And it looks like a, almost like a painted National Geographic map. It still has some issues that I'll get into later. So... <laughs> One thing that might affect people's trust in maps is whether they see it created by AI or whether it's created by a human. And so current literature on detecting misinformation suggests that people have a hard time detecting if misinformation is present in maps. And so since AI generated maps, especially with DALI, are using synthetic data and often have misleading information, people might also have a hard time detecting if a map is generated by AI. Although a lot of the maps that you're going to see generated by Dali are pretty bad. Um, so a follow-up question is, does making does a human-made map seem more trustworthy than an AI-generated map? And so I'm actually going to, I looked at the sample of maps that Yu Hao Kang in the previous presentation had generated. And I looked, I was trying to find characteristics of these maps created in Dali that might affect the trustworthiness, people's perceptions of the trustworthiness. And so it's pretty obvious, as people have also talked about already, that a lot of the Dali maps have really strange text. Uh, my favorite one is, oh, it's actually covered up here. But uh, this is the state of Indiana in the United States. And this actually is labeled as India, which is definitely not India. Um, and then Idade and Forma Fista, which is Florida in the United States. Um, so coming back to my definition of trust, this is not only inaccurate, but it's also unethical to label things as such. Also, there's some sort of distortion. I don't think uh, Dali is actually projecting maps. Pretty much all maps use a projection of, of some sort. Um, so you can see the map of Chile is, is heavily distorted in its, in its shape. And so while some distortion is inevitable in a map, um, a lot of times Dali is really minimized, is not minimizing the distortion as a, as a cartographer should be. And then the final characteristic is that a lot of the maps, the symbology looks almost more like painted or artistic, similar to what we talked about earlier, how some of the, the training images that Dali was used on are probably weren't maps and they were more like abstract images or paintings or other art. 
And so this isn't inherently unethical or inaccurate because all maps are going to have some level of abstraction. Um, but some of the generalization that can occur is, I think, significantly to a greater degree than a lot of human generated maps. And so I want to conclude with some, some future steps. I think it's really crucial to understand um, if we can actually have AI like Dolly leverage geos real geospatial data to create, create trustworthy maps. Um, it seems like from a paper talked about earlier that ChatGPT or something else can actually use real ge geospatial data. So that's, that's encouraging. Um, and we also need to test whether people can distinguish between human and AI generated maps. And does this actually affect people's perceptions of trustworthiness of the maps? And then kind of what I did in this presentation, I need to isolate features of AI generated maps that might affect trust. And then can we also train AI to fix issues like weird text, distortion, and symbology? Um, that's all I have. Again, I, I was looking at maps from Yu Hao Kang's study, which can be found here. And I just want to say that I have a follow-up talk on Tuesday morning. I didn't put the room number um, on here, but I'll go into more about trust and cartography then. So hello, everyone. My name is Marketa Vaitlova. I'm from Czechia, from the Stand Up Podcast group. And today I would like us to talk about the uh, importance of trust in maps. So uh, the trust is an important factor for uh, human communication, and it consists uh, it consists of user. Cre uh, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, it's based on users' criterion like accuracy, credibility, currency, comprehensiveness, and reliability. And uh, in our field, it's important for decision making, for foundation knowledge for safety navigation, minimize fear and uncertainty, and promote cooperation. Uh, in this picture, you can see the model of information trust from Lucasen. It's uh, divided into two parts. The first one is about information characteristics. And uh, if we talk, talk about our field, so we can, uh, we can replace uh, the to do to first part uh, to map content and uh, map visualization. Uh, the other part of uh, this model is uh, about user characteristic, uh, which is about uh, domain expertise of the user and information skill. And this, all of these uh, leads to the trust judgment. And uh, how to, how to uh, use AI uh, to to in 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 this model or in this in this process of uh, trust judgment. So we can talk about the map characteristic, and uh, this is about creation of map content. So currently, we somehow possible to to create. No, AI is possible to create map content, and somehow is trustworthy. Uh, the other part is creation of the visualization. Uh, it's uh, currently almost possible, uh, and but uh, but impossible with the real data. And uh, about the point of view of the source, uh, AI is currently not not uh, trustworthy. And from the from the other part of the model, from the user characteristic, uh, uh, currently uh, AI does not help users to to just uh, trustworthiness, but it could, I, I hope, uh, because uh, uh, map could uh, be judged automatically. Uh, for example, like that you uh, unload, upload uh, the map and the software will compute you how you can trust in this map, for example. Or uh, it could uh, be uh, used to uh, judge the trustworthiness uh, by, by, for example, well, according to eye tracking data or or some some how so, or some somehow help to users to judge the trustworthiness. So something about my future plan. So uh, the first step we need to know we need to understand how people judge the trustworthiness of maps. And uh, after that, we, we could be able to understand what elements people assess as trustworthiness, what does it mean to them, and what's their, their strategy for, for the judging the trustworthiness. 
and this knowledge uh, uh, could lead to know or, or as a know how people trust maps and it could serve as a, as a basis for uh, artificial intelligence judgment for uh, of the trust in maps. So that's from, all from me. Thank you for your attention. Okay, so this is, um, <clears throat> this originally started with an undergraduate student project. Um, so the original idea, his project took a very different turn um, but he was the original inspiration about thinking about this idea. So I've credited him here on this talk. Um, come on, I want to go. It just, there we go. Okay, <clears throat> so I want to talk about the idea of cartographic misinformation. And Mark Monmanier has a nice quote, um, basically saying that every map lies. And that's true to a certain extent, right? We don't represent everything about the world. That's part of the power of maps. Um, but we can think about um, lies of omission and lies of commission. So what do we leave out? What do we, a uh, live commission might be if we have exaggerated something. And sometimes there's good reason for doing that, to be able to show something clearly. We can also think about deliberate or unintentional inaccuracies that might be present in maps um, and whether or not, um, yeah, there was an intent by the cartographer to paint a particular picture of a situation that they're mapping. <clears throat> but people generally believe that maps are true, unless they're, they're shown a map that's like so ridiculous that they can't believe it's true, right? But the default presumption is that people believe maps are true. So one of the things that I was interested in is, does this belief relate to maps form? And this is good that I came after Tim's talk because he's already talked about some of these things. Um, but a question that I'm interested in is how might a map reader identify if there is um, map misinformation? Right, so um, we can look at some literature that has kind of explored some of these themes. Ian Mielenhaus did a series of work about a decade ago um, where he was interested, not specifically in the concept of trustworthiness, but he was interested in different types of rhetorical styles, one of which was the authoritative style, which you see here, um, and which he defined based on a content analysis he did of maps. And the thing I want you to notice here is that of the styles that he identified, um, authoritative is this blue, um, and you can see that it's the most trusted sort of style um, that people uh, in, in, this, in the exper uh, empirical experiment that he did. Um, so the, the, it may be that people are um, assuming that when a map looks like this, as if it has been produced by a government authority or something like this, they trust the process that went into creating that map, right? Okay, um, so we can look at cases, Carolyn and I uh, once found an example of where a, an organization um, deliberately tried to hijack uh, the authority of, <laughs> of scientifically reviewed uh, maps, which is this one here on the, the left-hand side, <laughs> um, to promote uh, very different ideas about how the world is. Um, you can see the form of these two maps is very similar, but the arguments that they make are very different. Um, in fact, quite opposite. Um, so they're definitely trading on the form of the map to try and, in fact, uh, I would say disinform people uh, in this case, not just misinform them. Okay, so a question is, all right, what do AI maps, generated maps look like? We've seen a few examples of that, particularly from DAL-E, um, and if, actually a few of you use their other tools, but um, a question is, do, can they have an authoritative form? Do they? Um, I'm not going to talk about this because you have gave a nice introduction <laughs> to it, so uh, I don't need to waste any time on this, um, but you can see some of the problems. Um, but another approach, um, and this is from that paper that Arzu uh, introduced this morning, and this is a very very different way of using AI. Um, this is a way of using AI to basically capture the expertise of the cartographer in code. Right? So you're using AI not to generate the actual visual map, you're using AI to generate the code that then produces the map. Right? So you are actually capturing real intelligence um, in the process of doing this. Now, there are still some problems. Uh, here you can see this is a map from a series of maps of southern states. 
Um, so a southern state is Mississippi, shown here, but there are also some counties called Mississippi in some other southern states, and they appear in the map of Mississippi. So this is a problem um, and inaccuracy that we see in this map. Um, we can also see that uh, the, the fault thing that's generated, um, so they tried to, um, the authors tried to take one of these maps in Florida and convert it to a web map, and the top map is the first thing that was generated, right? By refining their prompts, they generated code that produced something at the bottom, which is much more like what we would consider to be an authoritative or a, a map that we would recognize as produced by a cartographer. Oops. Okay, we can also think about, <laughs> <laughs> all right, <laughs> I will sum up in very quickly, um, the data that goes underneath, right? Um, and Bo Zhao did this great paper on deep fakes and, and imagery, right? Um, so, this, uh, this is the input into our mapping. And a question that I have is, could we even tell that something like this went into one of our maps by looking at the form? I don't think we could. Um, I've left you with a whole bunch of other questions that this prompts for me. You can, you can look at the slides online um, and I'm happy to uh, have some discussion about this in the, the panel at the end. <laughs> Okay, so um, Bo Zhao did a presentation at Autocardo 2020, 2022 last year. Um, the whole thing is online. You can take a look at it. But... Uh, Basic geography, in a narrow sense, is quite a realistic satellite imagery that has forged by QAI in order to illustrate a landscape that doesn't exist in the real world. That satellite imagery and their most Saddam dances cannot be distinguished by human eyes. So this is what Amy was talking about. We don't even know if it if it's real or not. He went on in his talk to talk. Uh, he went on in his presentation presentation to talk about ways that they are now beginning to detect deep fake satellite imagery. And um, at Esri, we're doing a lot of. Uh, we have a lot of discussion. We have a lot of uh, marketing around GeoAI and the use of GeoAI in a lot of different areas in text in vector and tabular data management, in imagery and remote sensing analysis. And we are talking about, you know, how AI can advance the capabilities. We have toolboxes, we have lots of models that are already pre-trained that you can just download and use. Even though ethical and explainable AI is on this slide, I have not engaged in those conversations at Esri. I haven't heard them yet. But we also talk about AI having the ability to simplify workflows, obviously, um, having automated deep learning, automated uh, machine lang uh, learning languages. And um, so this is a conversation we're having, but also you will see us say that there's this distinct, distinct wrong about deep fakes. So um, it got me to thinking about how chat GPT is then leading us in a certain way at even in, within ESRI. So it's, uh, you know, an extrapolation of natural learning processing models that infer relationships between the words and the text. And then not just the words, but the phrases and the sentences. And so depending on your input, it's going to give you an output, but it's always based on the data that it was trained on. And so just recently within Esri, we, we developed chat, Esri chat GPT because we have legal responsibilities using regular GPT. What these business terms and conditions use of use are, I'm not sure, <laughs> but we're supposed to use this instead of chat GPT. One thing to note is that the underlying models and data that are used are the same as chat GPT. Okay, so... Where does that lead us? I'm making up this word, Esri Map GPT, but I, it's happening. We are working on this now at Esri to come up with AI ways to create maps, AI ways to create story maps, and AI ways to create dashboards. And the same you know, logic applies. We want to help people to simplify their workflows. We want to advance the capabilities. I mean, maybe using these methods, we can produce better maps. <laughs> Our users can produce better maps. Maybe they can have more solutions of, you know, the maps that they actually want to end up using. So that leads me to where I fit within my organization, where we fit 
within the larger community to help advance this effort because it's going to happen whether we want it to happen or not. So then what data do we use? What models do we use? Because these are not language models. How do we evaluate the results? How do we make sure that there's still an aesthetic quality to the maps that come out? Whose responsibility is it to make sure that the maps and the data are being used correctly? And who claims copyright? And what if people are using those abilities to do things for nefarious reasons? So this leads us to some opportunities, even within the organization. I'm not going to say you should do this. I have to do this too. I have to help see if I can get my foot in to lead this development or some of the, make sure that the questions that need to be asked are asked to help that the, make sure that the methods that are developed produce the best results, that we are able to make sure that we know if we're making deep fake maps, that we can detect them. And then we can evaluate those deep, take, deep fake maps to see how they were made so that we can then make sure that we're detecting them, which is sort of where Bo Zhao was going in his work now. And that leads me full circle to where I'm done with my talk. And I think this is where we need to be thinking. Thank you. All right. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Lily. I am a master's student at Penn State. And yeah, I'm going to talk about um, some possible challenges of AI in um, education settings. So basically what I'm kind of interested in is how can this assist TAs, assist instructors? I really don't want to um, replace them. I think that's an important like ethical concern that we're not replacing jobs, but maybe we can assist TAs by having AI answer basic questions. Um, and I'm also kind of curious, can it extend, can it extend into farther learning questions that are beyond those just very basic ones to maybe help students plan research projects, find academic sources and things like that. So I've got two examples here today. Um, the first is a maybe intro to cartography student who just has some simple questions. So this student wants to find an appropriate map projection, um, but their TA is pretty busy answering a lot of other bigger technical questions. So they're gonna start by trying to use ChatGPT. So they ask, what map projection should I use for a core plus map of the US? And they actually get a pretty good answer for this basic question with really good reasoning and explanation too. So the student is pretty happy at first. Their TA is happy that they have time to answer other questions, but now the student wants to learn more. They wanna know about the source. So they ask that and ChatGPT doesn't have a specific source it's using. It is a combination of a lot of different things. So they're gonna ask a more specific question um, you know, what is a good source to learn about map projections? And they get this whole big list, but this student doesn't like the examples. They don't want to buy a book because they're a student. They don't have the money for that. Another recommendation is to take an academic course. Well, they're already in one. And they also don't want to do number five, attend a professional conference because they want an answer now. And they're also only an intro student. Um, so basically they say more specifically, they want something quick online and free. This result is kind of interesting. The first one is this cool projection wizard tool. It's, it's something I've seen before. It's really interesting, but it doesn't have a lot of explanation. So this student is a little confused by that. The second two links are just broken. And the fourth link is to Wikipedia, which this student has been told is not a very good source to use in classes. So now they're frustrated. They say this, um, and now it is the same list, just not with links. It's just a list. So now they actually go and Google each of these individually. And number three actually works out really well. It's a choose a projection article by Esri. But the student could have gotten there a lot faster by just Googling it first rather than using ChatGPT. So I don't think they're going to keep using it. Uh, my second example is maybe a more advanced student, a grad student who wants to write a research paper on the intersection of cartography and queer theory. And they're, of course, going to do a lot of their own research, but maybe ChatGPT could be a good starting point for them. So here they just ask, how would you define queer cartography? And we get this long, very bland, just like word jumble here that doesn't really say anything of substance. Um, so they ask for a more succinct definition, and it's okay, but it's kind of not that deep, and it doesn't really incorporate theory, right? This is a grad student, they want to incorporate theory, so they say that, and then they ask also where the definition is from, and rather than actually incorporating ideas from queer theory, ChatGPT just 
plops that phrase into the previous definition rather than doing anything interesting. And again, says that it didn't draw this definition from any particular source. So the student's like, okay, I'm not going to get a good definition from chat GPT, but maybe I can get some academic sources, right? Maybe because they get a list of five sources and only two of them are real. The other ones are maybe by a real academic who does research in this realm, but it's not actually a real source. And then some of them are also real titles of real articles, but the author that is given by ChatGPT is not a real author. Um, so it's really, it's not helpful. They tell this, they say, can I have some articles that actually exist on Google Scholar? And ChatGPT puts in this list of like five keywords that they could go and type into Google Scholar, which is what they would have normally just done in the first place. So ChatGPT also seems like it's potentially just a waste of time for this more advanced research. So overall, ChatGPT might be able to help with basic questions, which again, could help TAs in some intro courses, but it's not really ready to go beyond these really basic questions. It's not getting a lot deeper. Um, we do know that uh, students will be trying to use this in their courses. So if you're making a quiz, a test, or an assignment, maybe it does make sense to go for the slightly more advanced questions that AI can't answer and maybe check by putting those questions in AI at first. And it could also be interesting to remind students, like, this is a good reason that you should double check information, not just test the source uh, or not just trust the source based on whatever it says. But I'm kind of curious, I guess, once we get to explore around a little bit more, if any of you have used this, um, how can, thank you, <laughs> how can um, ChatGPT actually work? Has anyone figured out any phrases that actually work well? Thank you. <laughs> hey folks, glad to see everyone here. Uh, I do want to let you know, I did time my presentation, so it's at five minutes and one second, so I will be getting the horn. Uh, I'm very excited uh, about that. Um, actually, no, I am going to try to stay on time. Um, so uh, today I'll be talking about uh, creativity, labor, and cartography in the age of AI. Uh, and one of the things I've been really enthused about with uh, these other presentations, not only in this session, but in the previous session, is that there are a lot of uh, there seems to be a lot of discussion about the labor of being a, a cartographer and how we do uh, our work. And so I want to start first by saying uh, that this is not a Luddite issue. I'm not a Luddite here. Uh, if you're not familiar with what a Luddite is, uh, you can Google it, but basically it's someone who is anti-technology. Uh, I am not approaching this as someone who is against technology, but rather wants us to think through about what it means to... Uh, be a cartographer. Uh, and so one of the things I want to point out is that there's always been some form of quote unquote menial labor in cartography. Um, and menial is kind of a, de a demeaning word. So it's not, that's, that's not the best word to use, but it's really repetitive work. Uh, and so this is as someone who's very interested in the history of cartography. This has gone on for a long time. Uh, I won't go into this photo too much, but basically updating maps, uh, there were large armies of people, mainly women, who would cut out individual slips to paste onto maps to keep them corrected. Uh, we know that today, uh, for example, Apple Maps employs kind of a large contract army that of non-Apple employees who do not get the same sort of benefits uh, as Apple employees do to make Apple Maps work. Uh, and we've also seen, uh, at least in the United States, uh, Mapbox, a company Mapbox, uh, try to start a union, not necessarily around these menial labor issues, but really just labor issues in general, uh, and how that has actually led to the company um, uh, outsourcing a lot of different components of their jobs because they don't want to deal with the American labor market. Uh, and so AI it kind of is a challenge that basically under capitalism, creating a map under capitalism, uh, the idea is to pr produce a map the most efficiently, or most effectively, the most efficiently. Uh, and so that means that, you know, not all of us will be out of jobs, but what we're doing is going to have to start changing. Uh, and so I think that there are some really strong parallels here to the immense, but I think highly overblown debates, at least in the United States, about AI in the classroom. Um, no one is going to argue that ChatGBT cannot automate some aspects of, of a writing assignment, 
uh, or that future iterations of AI are going to run uh, roughshod across other forms of assignment. But the question that we need to ask ourselves is what do these assignments that we're asking our students um, to do actually do? And so if the goal is to get our students to produce something, basically anything really, then chat GPT is a perfectly acceptable use. It is the solution to a form of educational busy work. And so I think cartography is going to face similar debates. And this is not necessarily around cartographic education, but what it means to be producing a map. And so the challenge as a, as a cartographic community, I think, is to begin to start defining what these questions and these tasks are. Uh, and so AI, as we have seen, is clearly here, but it's nowhere near where it needs to be to kind of put us all out of jobs, nor will it actually put us all out of jobs. But the question that we need to be asking is how are we going to frame the use of AI in cartography to ensure that we do not have, uh, you know, have our salaries cut, that we lose lots of jobs, that being a cartographer is an unsustainable practice. Uh, and so some of the questions that we might consider asking are, you know, what aspects of the cartographic process would we only want a human to do? Uh, what sort of knowledges, and, and by knowledges, I'm talking about things that are not necessarily technical, so not necessarily button pushing, but also, you know, kind of, you know, knowledge about map projections and things like that, uh, should cartographers be expected to know? And how do we try to preserve the more artistic side of cartography that is, and I'm defining artistic here, not in terms of aesthetics, but in terms of the individual practice of cartography, how individuals have certain aesthetic designs that they appreciate that they translate into a mapped product. So how, how, do, we, how do we preserve those? Uh, and so I think while there's one side of this that is uh, a, a very much about creativity, uh, what I what I want us to also think about is that while there might be a natural push for labor organizing in individual workplaces, which I'm totally supportive of, please, if there's a union, I'll help you join it and form it. Uh, but I think we need to think of cartography as a form of practice that exists outside of the boundaries of the economic marketplace, period. <laughs> so thank you all very much. Take it away, Andre. All right. Thank you very much. So I am German for the last 30 years. I've lived in the States. Now I'm at San Diego State University. And yet this is a strange kind of homecoming because I was married in Stellenbosch. And uh, the wedding photos were taken on the steps of the theology faculty. So you might say this meeting is divinely ordained, uh, or I should just thank the organizers. Um, uh, now, what I would claim is that the Wild West days of AI are almost over. Uh, it costs real money to do AI. Uh, $700,000 a year, uh, a day, I think, for ChatGPT. That adds up to real money. A billion here and a billion there is real money. Uh, the trust issues um, lead to the need for regulation. Um, sometimes the trust issues are kind of fun, as we've seen before. If you ask it to make a map of Cape Town, it wasn't trained with sufficient data about Cape Town, so it expands it to basically create uh, three of the four maps are basically maps of South Africa. Um, but sometimes the trust issues are more serious, like if you ask uh, Stable Diffusion to create thousands of images illustrating a particular job profession, uh, you will find uh, not simply societal structures sort of uh, perpetrated, but actually much worse. So, for example, uh, apparently housekeepers are Filipina or otherwise uh, East Asian women. Uh, and uh, so this is the, the summing up of hundreds of images created for these professions. And uh, politicians are white and fast food workers are black and female, even though in the US, for example, 70% of fast food workers are white. And of course, it's, so it's actually much worse than reality. And it's completely without regional consideration, because in South Africa, of course, the majority of, of politicians are black. Uh, so regional models are completely missing. It's all sort of one global model for everything. Uh, it's very easy to get these models into inconsistencies and to trip them up and to admit that as much, even though ChatGPT says, I misspoke while uh, Claude at least says, I misled, neither of which is probably the right phrase. 
Uh, in response, there's an emerging web of regulation, strongest probably in the EU, which takes a risk-based approach. But even at limited risk, you have a transparency obligation, which could range from just making you aware that you're using AI to actually unraveling what happens, because even without that, existing law in the, in the EU requires or gives an individual the right to meaningful information about the logic of algorithmic systems and a right to explanation. And there has been real legal cases where people have, for example, reinstated to a job uh, because they were fired based on an algorithm. Now, um, you could say, how, do we, how are we transparent? And Lily was trying this, right? You could ask ChatGPT to be transparent about how it works. It will happily define transparency in AI systems, but it will not tell you how it came up with that. It will be extremely opaque and point to things that don't have anything to do with the question. Now, you could also ask it to draw its reasoning, right? So here, code generation, uh, P5.js, and it does actually do a pretty good job, except at its core, the learning network is completely opaque. It is a neural network with different loadings and weights, but otherwise uh, it's completely opaque. Now, that's where we come in as cartographers, our spatial perspectives, as geographic information scientists. We've always had two ways of looking at the world, as discrete objects, and that's what's been driving knowledge graphs and ontologies. But we also have the view of the world as occupied by continuous fields, things that exist everywhere with different magnitudes simultaneously. And that is the world of generative AI and neural networks underneath here. And of course, the challenge right now is how to link the two. We've so we had this pendulum swing to this direction. Now we have to land in the middle and let the two inform each other. And how can we do that? How can we let cartography inform explainable AI? So one approach are these activation atlases, which basically allow us to see what the AI sees, those hidden layers that, by the way, also allow us to understand uh, hallucination. For example, a paper towel uh, some texture of it is a bit like a poodle. Um, and you can also get the idea that information is distributed with different magnitudes rather than in, in existing in one place. And we can turn that into commercial products as we have, and it's now patented, in fact, where we directly interact with the model. We create a visual model that we're interacting with, for example, here querying uh, or interacting with the map. Now, on Thursday, we're going to take a more radical approach of directly doing inference in high-dimensional space, projected into two-dimensional space. And finally, I would turn Azu's question around from how will AI change cartography to how will cartography change AI? Because we have a lot to contribute beyond making maps of geographic space.